It's the Craggy Rugby Podcast. I'm Rob Murphy. Connacht have lost by 48 points to 32. And that's four in a row in defeats. They're out of the Challenge Cup. The Leicester Tigers at Welford Road have mauled Connacht around the park, picked apart all their mistakes. And uh, bar a encouraging and at times frantic fight back from Connacht, they just didn't have the answers to the Leicester par and they are out of the competition on the show to discuss it here from studios in TG Carr where we did our commentary. Alan Deacon. Hi Rob. Yeah, that's grand. William Davis. Good evening. Good evening indeed. Happy Easter, lads. Happy Easter, everybody. Why not? Uh, listen, look, here we are. I don't know. It's very disappointing, William. Let's... You know, we're trying to regroup a little bit. We're waiting to do the post-game interview, so I'll have to pause when that comes because they had some problems with their Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi wasn't their only problems tonight with him. Uh, no, that would have been uh, the least of their problems. Um, it's pretty much the result I expected. Uh, I didn't expect it to be the margin to be quite that wide, um, but it's really the performance by Connacht, which at times was nearly sublime and at other times was ridiculous, especially in the first half when they handed three out of Leicester's four tries to them through inept decision-making, bad position. And to get the game back to two points with seven minutes to go and fail to deal with a clever kick-off, and Leicester then got in and, and got the, the score that was going to be the key one to put them uh, nine points clear, and they added a little bit to that. Although to score that number of points and... Um, it was always, I think, going to be a very... I thought it was always going to be an open, a bit of a crazy game. They all have been. We haven't seen a tight, normal, titanic battle in any of these European games yet. Um, there you go. Let's uh, roll on to the uh, Rainbow Cup. Oh, that was... that. Like, I was ready to just, you know, temper everything you said and try and link to Alan, but he had to do that. Roll on. How can we roll on after that? Yeah, because I don't think it was a typical game in England because we didn't turn up. We turned up for maybe 15 minutes of the second half. It's the joint most points we've ever scored in England. The last time we did that was against Gloucester in that qualifier when we lost to the, you know, when we gave the 35, 40 points to 32 when John Muldoon got penalised for the in the last second of the game. But that was like, we, we were a good team then and we played good rugby and some of the stuff we went against us weren't great. But today, some of the stuff was no excuses. The lack of work rate. I almost tweeted at one stage or texted in during the commentary that, you know, I wasn't impressed with our, our work rate or the lack of work rate. There was two or three guys working their nuts off. Not everybody was. I, I, and just back to you, Alan, because I think you're absolutely right. What's been remarkable about this run of defeats in England is the amount of times Connacht have got standing ovations from the home team the crowd as they left via Gloucester. Great for because they're great fans anyway. It's been a lot of time for them. But... But they were doing it like Ulster do to us when we used to play really well uh, up there. They were delighted because they beat us every time, but there was always a cracking game. Connacht always gave it everything. Who remembers the brilliant documentary when Eric Elwood was coaching us and the heartbreak of losing that one and all the other three defeats there? Northampton, mm -hmm. one bad kick in the closing stage from setting up a lineup to win that game. These were full strength Northampton and Gloucester sides. Mm -hmm. You know, Connacht don't necessarily underperform and get hammered in England like that. In fact, they just don't. They usually show up. I agree with you. Tonight, when you're conceding 48 points, you can't say that's in the same category not even close because that was their second stroke third team there was maybe five of their first team players in that 23 the average age of their bench was 21 and they hammered us in the last 10 minutes of the game like you know I'm just I, I this is angry I've ever been about a Connacht team but a, a display a shocking display I love this William is, go, is wondering do I go further do I go deeper or do I bring it back they were two points behind with seven minutes to go and they made one very serious error. Abraham Papaili took a, a kick off and got stripped. Uh, that's played properly and Connacht could probably have won this game. They stayed in the game. They were allowed to stay in the game by Leicester making errors and Connacht were good enough to actually spot the fact that they weren't defending at the breakdown area and they scored a couple of tries off it. It was just a crazy game. But the first half was appalling. That, that, that's my real concern, is when you give away, you hand them three tries just through... Uh, the driving mall doesn't bother me because that's how they score their tries. Mm. 
but when you've got players we're just watching one of them here again now John Porch goes up for a ball taps it in and he just walks in in fact there's only about four Le- uh, Leicester players there and, and there seems to be about 12 Connacht players but it's just the way the ball went from a simple up and under there was the mistake at the breakdown yeah, area sorry, but the, that simple up and under came from John Porch had just come back on the field from a from a HIA that's clever play that's good play from Leicester to say yeah. right he's just come back on the field was... let's put him under pressure and see what he does yeah, I thought it was but, an old fashioned bomb at the right time exactly. it was yeah but, but again look at the work rate of the other players around them not enough guys are taking enough responsibility in my book yeah. defence is an attitude it's not a you can have whatever system you want but defence is an attitude and we don't have it I'm just watching the replay just to emphasise what you say when the ball comes down there are about six or seven Leicester players alive to it and there are about three Connick players alive to it and I think you know they were hunting in a pack for that ball obviously it was their, their front foot opportunity but it just backs up what Alan's saying and look I'll say this too as well as all the mistakes William I just got the feeling one of the things that's really been frustrating me all season is when we do get into a bad kind of zone or where we are when the team like the teams like Ospreys who beat us or Bristol I feel like those two games come to mind where they just were better than us when it mattered they had something in the locker that they could go to and score pretty easily when it mattered and that's what Leicester did every time Connacht rattled their cage in that second half they came out with an answer yeah they were more clinical um they, they took a couple of those opportunities well and they certainly, they, they'd no option at the start of the second half than to go for it because they were so far behind and they'd been so poor and Leicester were a little bit maybe switched off. It didn't take them long to switch back on again. Um, but I think it's the last seven minutes that is really going to, to stick in their throat because in a tight game, when you get back, irrespective of how you've got there or even how badly you've played, you are still two points away from the game with seven minutes to go and one bad error the good thing that uh, was done by Leicester they took their opportunity they got a chance there they got a sniff and away they went All right, let's uh, you know, pause for a second get a few snippets of the drama because I just think it'll sweep you through and there were some great moments for Connacht from the highlights of the commentary and let's pause also for a second just to have a listen to the post-game audio from Connacht Connacht inside the Leicester half to field Leicester being told to release Connacht going to attack the narrow channel they have a lot of players out there that's a really good line and they're away super opportunity for O'Brien he's got it back inside to Kieran Marmion and Marmion's going to go in and score Leicester five metres from the Connacht line with this line out and they're wasting no time they've set up and they've got the mall going already the throw is perfect the mall looks good is it unstoppable? I think it is Connacht have succumbed to Leicester's mall attack one stoppage, Heffernan is looking up okay, as the ball is back it, and he's been told to use it. Marmion's going to do it. It's a very slow ball. Nothing going in terms of the mall for Connick, but they're going to get the back line working. Carty's knocked it on. He's dropped it to the ground. It's a complete mix-up between himself and Daly and Leicester have picked it up. Leicester chasing down the field. They're going the length of the pitch now with 14 men. One pass will do it. They're going to go all the way from one end to the other end of the field and Moroni, Matthias Moroni off a pass from Guy Porter who picked it up has scored a try. Masterson's trapped behind the game line. Not his fault. It's all gone very very slow. Connacht underneath the post but 10 metres out now. Oliver coming back inside. Not met, no one with him. Driven back in the contact. Dennis Buckley's trying to rescue the situation. Leicester on their feet are over that ball. How have they not got a penalty there? Connacht are very fortunate to still be in possession. Paul Boyle strapped and stopped. Connacht haven't met this ferocity for weeks. Not since they played Munster as we said. And Leicester are just dominating the contact here. Beelham's under pressure. Ben Young's the scrum house over that ball. Have they turned it over? Connacht are nearly throwing the white flag here at this stage in this particular attack because they are out of ideas. Gavin Thornbury is just there to save the day. Now Heffernan as well. But Connacht are now 15 metres from the Leicester line. I don't think I've seen something go through this many phases behind the game line. Another smash hit from Leicester. They're just dominating the contact. Beelan with a carry. Leicester trapped him behind the game line. He could be injured there, so we'll just see how he is because he was trapped awkwardly. Leicester coming through. We're just waiting for the referee's whistle to go against Connacht. Buckley, Penalty. Heffernan... An advantage to Connacht. How have Leicester given a penalty away there when they're so dominant? No advantage, number nine, side entry. Connacht should kick the three points and get within two scores here, you'd imagine. Finlay Bielan tackles inside the 22 without much of a game. Leicester are off their feet, picking right through the middle of the ruck as Owen Masterson throws the dummy and goes for the line and scores the try. 
Dominic Robertson McCoy he's a really good target in those uh, carries and simple balls lovely pass back inside to Wooden for Blade what a brilliant backdoor pass no hands tackle well it goes Wooden he's got the score under the post they didn't tell, hold him he scored the try kind of can hold their discipline they haven't conceded a, a, an advantage for a penalty yet but that's what they did in the last two times Leicester there Leicester won a try or a penalty they're almost over the line Connacht have stopped them no they haven't Andy Friend first of all I mean just maybe assess that for us it, it was just such a bizarre game seven tries to four I think I made it in the end so maybe just give us your first initial thoughts oh, just another frustrating one Rob we, we I, I felt um, at key moments in the game we we gifted points when we should have been scoring points we had a you know, first half, you look at it, we had them man in the bin and they scored 14 points against us, which is just unacceptable. I thought we did well um, to probably get the penalty just at the tail end. So, you know, going into the, into the half time, 24-11, as we said, two scores down. We're getting beaten physically, which we were. Uh, we needed to change our game style, which we did. And then, you know, to, to then to, to get that change of, of game style, and then to get back on top, you know, on two occasions, we came back within two points of them and then we just gifted it back. So really, really frustrating, Rob. And, and uh, yeah, we keep making a habit of that, though. Yeah, it, was, it felt like a microcosm of the season, Andy. I mean, you know, because it, like, you're, like, we really were getting caught up in the brilliance of, like, Wooden's try off the pass from Caelan Blade. Paul Boyle's smart play sitting beside you there at the breakdown. Oh, Masterson as well. There was so much to get excited about. I'm sure some of our listeners drifted away at 24-8 and came back at 34-32 and were like, what is going on? So, like, in a sense, like, how how is it possible that, that a team can produce such brilliance and then get broken up? Is it part of the game plan, do you think? Is it part of the structure? Is it part of the mindset? Uh, it, it, it's something we are going to have to go and search for. But I said to the players in the change room it was, it was my instinct my gut thought we just we lack that killer we lack that killer instinct where um, we've got a team on the ropes and we've got to become that ruthless team that just buries them and we don't for whatever reason we let let the foot off the throat and you know we've got to change that whether whether we start to panic that we are we really here I don't know what it is mate but I think it's you know it's lapses where individuals just knock off and, and as we know um, you know, we keep talking about wanting to be the team that, that's fighting for silverware, but until we change that, we ain't ever going to get silverware. Is there something about English premiership sides at the moment that are making them harder to pin down, harder to kind of control? The games just are so broken. We've seen across the weekend and Leicester are the same here. Yeah, I mean, this is, it's, it is a slightly different game style that they play. They're very, very physical. And you can see that in the, in the first half. Like we were getting no change out of the physical confrontation stuff. So we needed to start to move them around. So the second half, we went in with a, with a, with a mindset of you know, playing, playing, again, smart, turning them, but also quick taps and moving them around. And once we did that, they couldn't live with us. And, and that's where we've got to get smarter. Like that is, That's our weapon. Our weapon is actually moving teams around. We, don't, we didn't want to get an arm wrestle. So we found ourselves in that arm wrestle in the first half. So, you know, premiership size, I mean, they're big men. And, and, and in fairness, too, like, yeah, we were missing a few. They were missing a heap as well. So that wasn't their best team. Um, but they still physically dominated us. And, and that's something we've got to have a look at. And if you were playing them again next week, maybe a second leg or something, what would you change? Uh, I would change, I'd definitely change probably some of our, our penalty options that we took. We had 10 penalties to one in the first half. We were content to slow the game down and to kick to the corner and, and then get get bullied. And I wouldn't. And, we, and you saw in the second half we didn't do that. In the second half we quick tapped and we went and we played and we. I thought our scrum was excellent, um, but we didn't get any change out of out of some other areas there. Which which uh, again and that happens. There's games where that happens. So we've got to adapt quicker and 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 not give them the opportunity to get their tails up and, and to damage us a little bit. So that's what I change up. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Paul Boyles beside you. Paul, I'll start with this. And like, I, I don't particularly want you to have to assess the referee too much, but you did go to the referee on our commentary. We could hear you in the second half. And you just highlighted to him 
the penalty count had been rising. He had warned Leicester in the first half. I mean, obviously they got one yellow card, and obviously there's a hell of a lot else that went wrong in the game. But at the same time, was that how frustrating was it to play against a team that had 13 of the first 15 bounties in the game? Yeah, <clears throat> it was very frustrating. Um, I suppose the most frustrating aspect of I suppose how the ref handled it near the end was or in the game was the end of the first half. He put them on a last warning. Mm. And we took the kick. And I said to him as we were walking off, don't forget about the last warning. And they gave away, gave away two penalties in the first five minutes. And I highlighted again that they were on a last warning and kind of nothing came from it. Um, but look, that definitely wasn't the reason we lost. Um, yeah. the, the referee was 100% not the reason we lost. We, we let ourselves down. Like Friendy said, anytime we got some sort of foothold in the game, we gave them easy access back into it. And, and that was obviously the main, the main reason we lost. Paul, there's a lot of honesty in the way you, you express yourselves with us. Obviously, there's great interaction. And at the same time, though, this is two games in a row now, like the Scarlet second half as well. I know there was kind of a broken side out there and there were, you know, the Scarlet had higher motivations in that contest. But just that first half seemed to be a kick on from the mess of the second half against the Scarlet. And yet the second half then obviously was much more like what Connacht are capable of. So maybe, I guess, give us a perspective on how frustrated you must be that to give those three tries in the first half away, those tries that were very avoidable. Really frustrating because uh, I said it afterwards, it wasn't a work rate thing or an energy thing. Like we were so up for the game, but they just got easy tries and um, we're going to have to look back at the video and I can't give an honest answer straight away because I actually don't know. Um, but it was silly errors um, that gifted them tries because on the whole, I spoke to Pete Wilkins after, like defensively, we were actually decent. For 90% of the game, we were actually decent, but it was that other 10% that they just let loose and we're obviously going to have to look at the reasons why. But on a whole, like defensively, for the majority of the game, we were actually decent. It just gave them easy access. How hard is their mall to stop? Yeah, look, they're big guys. It's, it's tough to stop. But um, yeah, it is tough. Yeah, that's all it is. And from here, I mean, you do have this final bit of the season that we all have to make sense of the Rainbow Cup. You, you obviously have an opportunity to try and fix some of these problems before the season's done. Yeah, 100%. And I suppose I've, I've seen a couple of things online that Jesus Connor are unlucky that they're after getting a, a tough draw and they've played the three interpros. But they're the games we want. And mm. if, if we want to push on for next season and, and, and have a go this season, we've got to beat the best. And, and we're playing against the best teams and the interpros are the best chance you have to, uh, to show how good you are. And I suppose we're going to use those three games as a way to show you guys, to show our supporters that we're building something and we are a good team. We just need to cut out those errors. All right, welcome back. Uh, lads, I don't know, where do we go from this? The bloody Rainbow Cup's coming up. I mean, look, it'll be great if Connacht win, but they're not going to because Connacht, despite finishing in the top four in their competition, have been drawn against the third, second and first ranked side, such as the inevitability of having to regionalise the whole competition to start with. So it just seems very unfair. I'll go with you first, William, that, it, that you're facing Ulster, Leinster and Munster again. Uh, it kind of takes away any sort of kind of, they have a chance of competing in this. That's... I still think it's quite bizarre that they didn't just play out the season and go for playoffs and get to a final in June. What about the money they lose from the South Africans? Well, we, they would have because the South Africans wouldn't have been able to. Yeah, return. there's there's a potential. I suppose the South Africans would have wanted some of their money back because their teams didn't get to get part. We still don't know. They could have come up with some sort of weird playoff thing where they let them play each other four or five times and join the playoffs at the end. Of the Who cares? Just. Something different. Well, they need to get the fixtures out so that people have some idea actually what's going to happen. We've got the weekends. We don't know what's happening for rounds four, five, and six, which is completely odd. Yeah, because I was my dad was on today going. I said, "Well, the Rainbow Cup's happening." He said, "Oh, is it?" I said, "Yeah." He says, "Well, when who are we playing?" I said, "Well, we've got the Interpros, but that's it. We don't know anything else." It's I know I know it's COVID and I know it's bizarre and, and they have to try and save the money from South Africa to keep involved and they have to try and, and all that and, and anyway it's the Pro 14's fault because the only Pro 14 team to win a match so far this weekend in the Challenge Cup is Benetton against Ajan win a game in the Pro 14 all season and, and has, have Ajan won a game in France yet I don't think they have <laughs> I think this, which only makes it they're down the bottom of the table aren't they without a win oh god who knows Alan check that out for me it doesn't matter uh Wider point. Yeah, I was just trying to wrap this up. This is, like, I'm concerned. Like, it's a week when we've seen two key coaches leave. We've spoken about it brilliantly on the podcast, might I say, lads, because I wasn't involved, so I can say that. Uh, well done. Um, and there's is, there is realities to that. 
it's an uncertain environment. But it wasn't a good week for Connick News when the lads were leaving. I know it's great news that Colin Tucker and Mossy Lawler are moving up. They've done incredible work in the background and we're excited about developing coaches like that. But you've got to be concerned as well about losing two voices there and just wondering what direction this entire project is going in. Well, I think it's going to mean a, a, a complete reset uh, for, for, for next season. Um, possibly needed. Which possibly in some ways couldn't can't come quick enough. But mm. there is still a lot of rugby to play. And I think they're going to have to... Fa- they have to face up to that. Though. They still have to play six games. Um, they, they may be able to use them wisely, though, and learn and develop, starting with a mall defence. Yes, that's a huge issue. I mean, so, so, sides. I mean, Leicester's is is a very good mall. Uh, it looked legal to us. Um, I'm kind of nearly sick of hearing about all these illegal malls because we're the only one conceding tons of tries. I know the Dragons one was that time, and and there were questions over I think Bristol as well, and so on and so forth. But like at the end of the day, team after team after team have done this. Yeah, and uh, that's a problem. We also don't have much of an attacking mall uh, ourselves. Uh, which is a huge problem because when you kick for the corner, that's what you're really looking for. That was massively underwhelming today, Alan, wasn't it? Hugely so. Like we got we got really badly bullied in the first half. Has to be said. We we started off okay, but then we just seemed to lose our way. We just seemed to lose our mojo, and and it got really badly bullied in that first half. The ten phases in the lead into Jack Hardy's uh, fortunate penalty on the stroke halftime, which actually kept Connacht in the game. Uh, were were the most damning ten phases in the Irish season in the twenty two. I'll be asking like our listeners will have heard me asking Andy Brand about it. I mean, pff, it just was so demoralising to watch. Well, everyone was off script at that stage. It was purely a uh, fifteen guys wearing the same jersey. It yeah. wasn't. That was it. It wasn't. It wasn't a team. There was no no cohesion, no thought, no control of any sort from anybody. The management did quite a job in the dressing room to actually get them into well, the cohesion. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. In the second half, they actually came out for twenty minutes, played the only bit of rugby they really played in the whole match for that 20 minutes but the the line out steal from the man who, uh, who yeah. came on the field Wales yeah when yeah, he came on he the field brilliant. he was brilliant last week he's a he's one of your typical big cap premiership players he hasn't played for his country but would play for a lot of countries and he's a super player Harry Wells 114 appearances but uh, he's a cracking player yeah that, that line out steal made a huge difference because yeah. it got them on the front foot they got a penalty got into the corner and then they, they, they scored again and that made a massive difference in the end um, but up to them we we kept ourselves in the game but it's yeah it's just hugely disappointing I think one of the interesting things is in some ways this sort of a score is what we have been seeing a little bit in the Premiership in England this season, where you get these games that seem to be out of kilter uh, in terms of 48-32 or 41. It's, it's, it's just the fact that Connacht don't win tight games very often. This game got tight and they didn't win it. Yeah, that was why I didn't think they'd win today. Everyone said their Leicester uh, week inside said, yes, it's going to be close, but they don't know how to win these games anyways. And that's another tight game that won. It was a two-point game with two, eight minutes ago. Uh, and, and that's what the, the betting was that uh, before the game started. It was a two-point win for Leicester. And with seven minutes to go, that's what it looked like. And then suddenly they kind of make one mistake and they're in. And then at that stage, it's over. But it's... Like you said it, it was 27-25, a chance to go into the lead. And you wondered after it was badly missed by Cardi. And it wasn't just that. It was, it was slightly out of his range, I think, anyways. Or, you know, it wouldn't be a guaranteed kick by any means. Wonder why Connick just didn't kick to the corner. Even if he was a guaranteed three points, you were wondering why not go for the, the try that could be on. Well, you're, you're in the game and you've dominated up to that point in the second half. And you've Papa Ely on and that's what he's there for. Your drive-in mall hasn't worked, but we haven't seen a player of his size and weight detaching from a mall with the ball in his hands. But that didn't give themselves the opportunity. And and, and it was, I think, right at Jack Carty's range because he, he really hoofed it. And it it could have gone over, but it didn't. And that was the only chance that Connacht had to actually lead the game bar the fact that Kieran Marmion scored first. And they also missed the conversion after that. Yeah, it's interesting because what I noticed from our uh, fellow Pro 14 side Cardiff last night too is they took a drop goal late on and I was thinking to myself when he kicked it, do you know he was well now to just run down that clock and make sure that penalty is the last kick of the game but they weren't boxing clever because I think they were underestimating the fact that any time is some time for these premiership sides to score. So yeah, I think, you know, as well as, oh, we can get 28-27 up. Yeah, that's all well and good if you have some sort of shutdown rugby ability. Otherwise, you better just go after every try that's there. 
Exactly. You know, the one thing you have to say, the, the premiership sides are not the dull, boring sides no. they used to be from the olden times. Flag that in the podcast during the week. Yeah, they're 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 out to play rugby and out to play good rugby and, and, and score tries from anywhere and everywhere. And um, they've certainly done it. There's a the bottom line here to today's game, because we'll have loads of time in the down week. Uh, we're going to take a week off, aren't we, Alan? Because uh, Danny has a big day. We'll wish him luck in a second. Um, but in the meantime, when we come back, we'll have a chance to just reflect a little bit. But I just So I want to finish on this game. And I want to say this, and Bodhi, you come in on this. It's, at the end of the day, Connacht capitulated in the first half, conceding three calamitous tries. And we can dissect that second half till the cows come home. But that's why Connacht lost. Yeah, because they handed them three tries through errors, and Leicester were quick enough, smart enough, lucky enough, whatever way you want to put it, to seize those opportunities and score. And that's what you have to do. You you have to seize your seize the day when you get the chance. And it's a problem that Connacht have. Now, in the second half, some of the tries that Connacht got were the sort of tries that they don't usually score because they're picking the ball up, they're seeing gaps, they're trying something. Caelan Blades' little inside pass to Wooten. Oh, that was lovely. I'm glad you mentioned that. Deserves a mention. And that's... But they had to do that because they were so far behind. But in the first half, uh, three of those tries are just, they're, they're X-rated stuff when you, when you see them. They're the sort of tries that you should never, ever be conceding. Maybe one, because in every game, you're going to make one mistake and you're going to get punished. But to have three, two in four minutes at one stage. Whilst, down, whilst the opposition were down to 14 men. It was 12 zip to 14 men. Yeah. That's just. Did you, ask during, did you ask during the week, or did someone ask? Did they practice for that? Yeah, during the week, one of the journalists, at Steve uh, Borthwick's press conference, said, "You get a lot of yellow cards. You're often down to fourteen and thirteen men. Do you practice for that when you're training?" And he said, "Yeah, of course we do. All teams do." Well, they don't expect what they practice for is to keep it nil nil or three nil to the opposition. But they don't expect to get gifts handed to them, gift wrapped. Here's a try. Just all you got to do is we're, when we make the mistake, you're gonna uh, you're gonna score, and they and, and and they did, and that's the real frustration, um, and that's cost them the game. But I still go back to the fact that somehow they were within two points and they just made another mistake and Leicester said thanks very much we are going to seize the seven points and we're going to put this game beyond you yeah but we're not the only Pro 14 club to do that this weekend every match between the Pro 14 and the English Premiership in the Challenge Cup has been won by the English Premiership side and some of them in worse scenarios like how Cardiff managed to lose that game last night I'll never know we kind of get relegated if they were in the English Premiership oh absolutely but then Dragons Dragons were 10 points up but four minutes to go and lost by four <laughs> you know but again but it's just but I, I feel like that's just it, it's kind of like playing the All Blacks in the old days you, there's a difference between being in a battle with them and beating them and, and there's a difference between Connick scoring 32 points away to Leicester in that great the game has changed quite a lot you can be well beaten despite scoring 30 points as we saw against the Scarlet absolutely and I don't you know everyone goes on about all oh, relegation you need one. you don't the best rugby team in the world, the best two, three rugby teams in the world for the last, since professionalism have been Australia, New Zealand and uh, South Africa and they don't have relegation. So this thing that you have to have relegation I agree with you, is I rubbish that, as far that as wasn't I'm my concerned. Point. It, was just, it was more to do with the fact that... Could no, no, that's, uh, no, sorry, that is something I just, I just get really frustrated yeah, when I keep hearing about it. You know, yeah. it's just it's it's rubbish. Tougher, more rounded, not tough. Yeah. All right. Rubbish. I think what's happened with England, actually, and maybe this is part of what's happened to the English Premiership size this season, is there is no relegation. And all of a sudden they're freed and they're, they're open to play a lot more f- joyous rugby rather than this grinding out rubbish that they've been doing for the last God knows how many like years. A guy who I thought was wearing in the first half, Zach Henry, um, can thrive and come true from second, third tier French rugby and get a chance and, and they can try things because they're not trying to scrape their way through. All right, lads, listen. We won't try and couch this in the context of the season because we have plenty of time to do that. Is that fair? Yeah, I think it's... Um, Feel free to do so if you want. This is your moment. Yeah, I think it was... Andy Friend des- described it as the start of the second part of the season. Well, unfortunately, it didn't last very long. Uh, Europe hasn't been very good this year. Uh, they've played three, lost three. Um, and they're back in the Champions Cup next year, um, which is going to concentrate minds a bit. I don't know how that's going to be set up. There's rumours that it may be the similar system that we had this year. Um just four games rather than six. Apparently the French are very keen on this, but television aren't. Um, that's going to be a big, big challenge for them because they're going to get an English team. 
and they're going to get a Bristol or a Leicester or somebody is if, if Leicester get in but you're in the Champions Cup it's the top six in the English Premiership that you get drawn against and that's a long way off but you can see the challenges that, that are there and the Rainbow Cup is three interprovincial games and we know how much of a challenge they can be yeah not looking forward to it we should finish on that Best luck, Danny Deegan, because we won't be chatting before then. It's big day. The man is going to be very close, reporting on it. Alan. Yeah, yeah. Danny's getting married to the lovely Bronwyn next weekend. Um, so I won't have to worry about any Connacht game next weekend because I'll be at the wedding as the father of the groom. There you go. At the star of our podcast. Well, he's not going to be the star of the day, but he's going to play an important role. That's it from us. Best of luck to Danny and thanks to you all for listening. We are nothing but frustrated here. We'll see where things go from here. Loose, cut it loose. Break out or nothing changes. Side 